We'll be focusing on the words from 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse 11. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for gathering us here around your word. Give us a a quiet spirit and open ears to hear your word, absorb it, and then be moved by it so it becomes actionable steps in our life, that it changes our life, transforms our life. And don't let anything I'm doing get in the way of the work of your spirit. In your name we pray, amen. It's that time of the year where the ads for uh, the election are going to stop. It's going to happen. You're going to get less stuff in the mail from from the election, but it's going to be replaced by requests for giving. And you know that's going to happen. Maybe you already feel it already that as we get closer to the end of the year, different organizations are going to make their appeal asking for gifts and giving you that that idea of, you know, if you give right now, you'll get that tax write-off. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I find myself like avoiding places where I know they're going to ask me for more money. Like you start to hear that, that bell ringing at pick and save and maybe you go in the other entrance or you maybe start look away or grab your phone or something like that. Or maybe, uh, you know, you just, you know, the different organizations that are going to appeal and make money. So maybe avoid uh, opening up that envelope or know what you're going to hear from that person. Why do we do that? Why do we avoid giving even when they're organizations or ideas or movements that we believe in? Why do we find ourselves um, avoiding giving? Why don't we want to make that that sacrifice? Well, today we're going to be beginning a brand new sermon series called The Ripple Effect. And this whole sermon series is based on the idea that, that God is going to use us and work in us And when he works through us, he creates this ripple effect that that affects people that we don't know. Uh, It it has this power to change lives of people we don't know yet and and creates this ripple effect. And the question I want to answer in this message is, what sacrifices are we called to make? What sacrifices are we called to make? And answer that question, we're going to look again at 1 John Now, this letter was written by John, but probably in his old age. He had already been following Jesus maybe 40, 50 years by now. Uh, He had walked with Jesus uh, as a a fisherman, and and Jesus uh, led him as a disciple and spoke to him and taught him. And then he witnessed Jesus dying on a cross. And then he saw him raised back to life, and he was commissioned by Jesus to be a leader in the church. And now... He's an old man, and he's speaking to this next generation of Christians. And, and when you get to a certain age, um, you don't want to mince words. You don't want to waste words. You want to talk about what is absolutely essential. And that's what he does here. He says in verse 11, For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. John says, when you start out as Christians, this is what you heard. This is the, the 
A, B, C is the faith. In fact, John says this is like the A through Z. This is what it's all about. It's about loving one another. Hopefully when you came into Christianity, John says, you heard this and you believed this. You knew that it was all about loving one another. And if your faith doesn't lead you to love one another, you're missing something. The Apostle Paul talks about that and, and when he writes to the Corinthians, he says, you can be so good about maybe doing miracles or prophesying or speaking in tongues, but if you don't love, your faith is useless. It doesn't matter. It's going to happen a lot with, with pastors when you go to school and you study uh, all this theology where you got all these categories of theology. You've read these big books and you know all the different terms of, 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 of doctrines. But sometimes you become a complete jerk. <laughs> you know all the theology. You know all the ideas. I don't know if you've met Christians like that. Who, if you gave them the quiz on, you know, the history of the Bible and the facts of the Bible and the doctrine of the Bible, they get an A plus, A plus, but they're a jerk. John says, that can't be. You've heard from the beginning that your faith has to lead to love. It's all about loving one another. Now, before he goes into explaining what that means and what that looks like and the practical steps of, of loving one another, he talks about what love isn't, the opposite of love. And he tells a story from the fourth page of the Bible. Now, if you had a Bible and you open up the first page of the Bible, it talks about how God created this incredible world and everything's perfect. Everything is just the way it's supposed to be. And humans are just the way they're supposed to be. But then they have this choice. Uh, either they can let God be God or they can reach for this fruit, which means that they were trying to take the place of God. God had this tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was God's tree. God decided what was good and evil. But they listened to the devil and they wanted to become God. They wanted to decide what's good and evil. That's what grasping for that fruit was all about. And because they put themselves in the place of God, they passed on this nature of taking instead of giving, of being selfish and self-centered and turned in on themselves. And the first child, Cain, gave himself so over to his own selfishness, it says that he was a murderer. That's what John says. John says, do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. Do you know that story? It's a very simple story, and it, it's, it's just so filled with wisdom and helps us understand uh, the issue of human nature. So you have Cain and Abel. Uh, Cain uh, was a farmer. He had, he had a harvest, and Abel kept flocks. Well, Cain gives an offering to God. He, he worships God. He brings some of his harvest and offers it up to God. And then Abel takes the best of his flock and offers it to God. And this is really, I mean, you can look at this almost like symbolically, like this is the difference between somebody who gives their leftovers in life and the person who does their best to the glory of God, giving their best to God in an act of worship. And when God sees what Abel does, giving his best to the Lord, doing his best for the glory of God, he's pleased. And when Cain realized that God is pleased with Abel who gave his best, instead of uh, changing himself and saying, you know what, I can do better, he becomes envious and angry. And God comes to Cain. He says, why are you so sad? Why are you so angry? If you would do what is right, I would be pleased with you too. But sin is like a, a tiger crouching at your door. It desires to have you, and you must overcome it. But Cain didn't listen to God's rebuke and his challenge. Instead of living a life of love and giving his best, he took from his brother. Actually, he took his brother's life. And John goes on to ask the question, why did he murder him? In verse 12, because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. He saw his brother doing the right thing and instead of saying, you know what, I can do better. I can offer my best to God also. He saw that and he took from his brother. He was envious, he was jealous, and he ended up taking his own life. That is the opposite of love, taking. And so then John goes on to explain 
what is the example of love? If, if Cain is the example of hate, what is the example of love? He says, verse 16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. That's love. When we realize that Jesus saw us in our mess and he laid down his life for us, that's love. That's what love looks like. I'm starting to feel my age. I don't know uh, what, if this has happened to you, but I think I'm 42 this year, 43, something. I don't know. I'm turning that age. And, I'm, and I feel, realize that there's less years probably ahead of me than behind me. And you start to realize that. Um, and then when you start to think about that, that no matter how much money you have, no matter how healthy you eat, no matter how much you exercise, no matter how well-liked you are by the world, no matter all those different ways that we try to protect ourselves, all of us are going to die, every single one of us. And when you actually stop and think about that, we do so much to try to avoid the reality that we're going to die. But when you actually think about that, there can be some fear. All the past mistakes and sins and selfishness probably come, you know, they come front to mind. And you wonder, how can I stand before a holy God? How can you? No, no matter how much money you donate or how much you, how much you have or, or how many friends you have or how well liked you are or how well you take care of, you're going to stand before God and what are you going to bring to him? John says that he realized we were in this state, that we had nothing to offer to God the reality that we're going to die, and it says that he laid down his life for us. He sacrificed his life for us. He, he, he put himself in our place. And so now, because of the finished work of Jesus, because Jesus lived for you, he died for you, and he rose in the body for you, you can be confident that you are a forgiven child of God. And so you don't need to be afraid to die. If you don't need to be afraid to die, you don't need to be afraid of anything. If your biggest enemy has been conquered, then you don't need to be afraid of anything. And when that grasps your, your heart, when you start to realize that, that Jesus loved you enough to lay down his life for you, John makes this application. And so we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If Jesus laid down his life for us, that's what love is, making a sacrifice, then we also ought to make a sacrifice for others. On Monday, I, I had the privilege of, our whole family went up to Wausau because um, Emily's father was in the honor flight. Uh, so he flew down to Washington, D.C. with 110 other Vietnam veterans and they had an opportunity to tour some of the, the memorials and monuments in Washington, D.C. And then they flew back that night and about a thousand plus people were at this Wausau airport to welcome these Vietnam vets back in. And it was just so moving. They, they had mail call on the airplane. Everybody uh, gave uh, letters and wrote letters to these veterans. And then they got to walk through this hallway in the airport and just welcome with this great big greeting. And they were honored because they should have been. They didn't receive that honor the first time they, they came back from Vietnam, but this time they were. They were honored, and it was just so moving. They were moved to tears. I don't think there's a dry eye in the whole place because they laid down their life for us. They laid down their life. And I think that's why it was so moving. If you've ever been like at a Brewer game or a, a Packer game where they'll honor a veteran at, at the game and the whole stadium stands up and cheers. The reason we cheer, the reason we honor those veterans is because they put their life on the line. They, they did that. They're doing the thing that Jesus did, where Jesus laid down his life for us, and so we ought to lay down our lives for others. And they literally did that. They put their life in the way of death. On the line, they lay down their life for others. And that's why it's so moving. That's why we all get choked up. That's why we're, we're so thankful for them. But now here's my question. Is that the only way that we can show our faith? Does that mean all of us need to, um, you know, 
leave our job and join the military and physically lay down our life for our fellow people? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. John goes on to explain uh, what this looks like for us. Uh, he, he, the next verse, he says, So if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? How can the love of God be in that person? So, um, I've heard this before. I've heard a text where, you know, you read Bible passages that talk about the importance of loving one another. But what's unique this time for me was to look at the Greek here where it says worldly possessions and he uses the word bios. Uh, you know, the word biology meaning life. And so John says, if anybody has these material possessions that really sustain our lives, and sees a brother and sister in need and has no pity, how can the love of God be in them? That was a new idea for me. I think that's why we, or maybe this is just me, avoid those opportunities to give. Like we hear the bell ringing, we see the stuff in the mail, and maybe we avoid giving. Because those people are asking to, us to give something that sustains our life. These material possessions, they sustain our life. We go to a job and make an income, we put the money in our bank, and that money pays for our kids' food and their clothing and a roof over our head. The money sustains our life. And so when somebody comes and asks us for money, they're asking us to give away the stuff that sustains our life. And that's why it hurts so bad, and that's why we avoid it, and that's why we might get so angry when we hear people asking us for money. They're asking us to, to take away something that sustains our life. And John says that's exactly the point. Giving is that opportunity for us to lay down our lives for other people. When we give, it is one way that we can say, I believe this stuff. I believe that Jesus laid down his life for me. And then I want to take the stuff that sustains my life and I want to lay it down for others. So that helps us answer our opening question. What sacrifices are we called to make? Giving is one way we lay down our lives. Being generous is one way we take the stuff that sustains our life and we give it on the behalf of others. Now John's thinking about this as an, as an older man and, and so that's why he ends this section by saying, Dear children, my dear children, let's not love with words or speech, with, but with actions and truth. Let's not just talk about love. Let's not just let love be an idea, but let it be an action. Let's not just love with words, but with actions and truth. Now, I, I'm a person that I love thinking about spiritual things. I love reading my Bible. But it takes a lot more work to actually be generous and do something with my faith, to show tangible ways of helping other people and serving other people. And not just letting this be my, my faith that I meditate on in my head, but the thing that I do with my life. I mean, you could think of it this way. I mean, let's not just love with words, but with actions and truth. You know, let's say you're going to a wedding and, and so you write this nice card for, for the new couple saying, I hope that God prospers your marriage and I hope you're very blessed and I hope um, it's just a, a wonderful, fruitful, blessed marriage. You write all these wonderful things on this card. I don't think they'd ever say that, but, they, but let's say you just gave that card with nothing in it and the couple receives it and say, that's wonderful. Maybe wouldn't mind putting your money where your mouth is, right? Put something in that card. And, and that's kind of the, the visual of what you're saying. You're not just talking about wanting them to be prosperous or talking about wanting them to be blessed, but then you actually do something about it and you bless them. I think that's what John is saying about our whole faith. Let's not just talk about our faith. Let's not just talk about love as this maybe idea or emotion, but let's put in action. Why? Because we have a God who put in an action for us. So here's the big take-home point. Let your love be tangible. 
We follow a God who, whose love was very tangible for us. If we had a time machine, we'd go back 2,000 years and there was a real Jesus who walked in this world and you could have touched him and hugged him and saw him and he really died on a Roman cross to pay for all your sins and he really rose in the body. And then when we, we gather here, we, we tangibly receive God's love as we're washed in our baptism. We tangibly receive and experience God's love when we come and take the Lord's Supper together. And so because God has been very tangible in his love for us, he has really given to us, let's be tangible in the ways that we serve and love one another. Now what's great about victory is you guys all come from lots of different places. There's people who attend this church from Kenosha, Racine, uh, Wind Lake, uh, Brookfield, Milwaukee, Waukesha, all over the place. I don't know what's going on in your community. I don't know what it looks like uh, and what the needs are necessarily in Kenosha or in Waukesha or in your corner of Milwaukee. But you do. And so it's my prayer that you would receive this tangible love of Jesus and then be open to the ways that you can now lay down your life for other people around you. I don't know, maybe it's that small business that you see is, is just kind of starting, they're trying to get off the ground, and you go and you, you buy something from that local business because you want to support them and you encourage them, not just with words, but with actions. Maybe it's a, a, a women's shelter in your community. Maybe it's just a neighbor who's really struggling right now and, and you bring over some food. But your love is not just an idea, but you receive the tangible love of Jesus and so you want to love those around you in tangible ways. And when you do, it creates a ripple effect. It's not just between you you and that other person, uh, it's a way of God continuing to love and change the lives of people that you won't even know. It, it was such a blessing to see uh, my father-in-law and all these veterans at that honor flight. Um, to see them receive the honor uh, that they didn't receive decades ago and to be thanked for their service, for their sacrifice, you know, a lot of the ways that you give, a lot of the ways that you serve in these tangible ways, many people aren't going to see. In fact, Jesus tells us to do these things in secret that a lot of people aren't going to honor you. They're not going to see it. And that's okay. Because Jesus is coming back again. And he's going to resurrect your body and resurrect this world. And on that day, he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful in all these small little ways. You showed my love in tangible ways. Come and share in my happiness. And so our faith is all about love. But it's love that's not just a feeling or an idea. It's a love that takes action. It's the love of God that laid down his life for us. And so let's lay down our life for one another. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray that you would help us receive this good news, that you laid down your life for us, and so we don't need to be afraid of death. We don't need to be afraid of anything. We are completely taken care of. Our life and our death, everything is taken care of. You have been so generous to us. And so now, Lord God, move by your love, because we are at complete peace and you help us to see the people who are in need around us. Help us not just to love with ideas or mere words, but help us be willing to lay down the things that sustain us, to lay down our lives for other people. And when they see that, help them to see you, that you get all the glory. In your name we pray. Amen.